Hey, I'm Joshua Noob. I'm a professor of philosophy. And I'm Elizabeth Spelke. I'm a professor of psychology. And today we're going to be talking about what we can learn about the way that human beings think by looking at how babies see the world. So ultimately, we're going to be talking about some questions about how babies actually think about social categories. But before that, as a kind of background, we're going to talk about some older research about how babies think about other issues, like, for example, how babies understand number. So just to start out with, maybe you could tell us, how is it that we people study the question of how babies see the world? What kinds of behaviors among babies can we look at to see how it is that they're thinking about things? Right. Well, this, of course, has been the major stumbling block to learning anything about what's going on in an infant's mind. And people have been asking questions about the origins of human knowledge for 2,000 plus years. But the actual uh, systematic study of infants has a much shorter history. Uh, It's barely 50 years old. And the study of the kinds of cognitive capacities that we're really interested in are abstract concepts of the world, the concepts that we use to remake the world. The study of those capacities is uh, barely 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's been slow going. And in large part, that's because although we now know that infants come into the world with considerable capacities to make sense of it and to learn about it, they can't do very much at birth. Uh, What infants are primarily good at doing when they first come into the world is looking around uh, and taking in information about what's going on around them by looking, by listening, uh, by flailing their arms around, uh, uh, and uh, eventually by reaching out for things. And so progress in understanding infants' conceptual abilities has come from harnessing these basic exploratory patterns in systematic ways uh, uh, through studies that try to get at uh, what infants are thinking about. So for an initial example, let's talk think about number. So okay. you might think initially that a baby couldn't understand what kind of number of certain things there were, that that was something that you could only come to understand later, say, as, as you grew up. So what kinds of research have you done on that kind of question about how children think about the number of objects that they're viewing? Right. Well, studies of infant sensitivity to number actually started very early uh, in uh, the field. There were studies going back 20 or 30 years where infants were presented, for example, with checkerboards that had four elements uh, by four elements, so 16 uh, uh, black and white squares, and showed that they discriminated those from checkerboards that had larger numbers of squares. The problem with all of these studies, though, is that As you varied number in these displays, you also varied other properties like uh, uh, how much contrast there was in in, uh, uh, display, how much low-level visual mechanisms were being stimulated by that display. So what we really needed to be able to do in order to see if infants were sensitive to number is to present displays uh, over a series of experiments where we systematically controlled for these other variables and ask, with those controls, do infants still respond? to number. Uh, The studies that finally convinced me that they do were studies conducted by Fei Shu, who's now at University of British Columbia uh, when she was in my lab, that involved presenting infants with simple images of black dots on a white background. And over trials, she presented different images uh, containing dots of different sizes, dots uh, presented in arrays uh, with different densities, uh, in different spatial positions, and so forth. But for any given baby, there was always the same number of dots in the array. Uh, And as babies saw these arrays uh, over trials, they started out by looking at them a lot. lot. And then over trials, uh, they showed a pattern that's been characteristic of uh, infants' attentional responses in studies looking at all sorts of different uh, uh, kinds of abilities. Namely, when you present something that's similar again and again to infants, their attention goes down. So over trials, infants' interest in these arrays declined. And then, once it had declined to to about half its original level, uh, Faye was able to ask, what is it that they're becoming bored with? What are they encoding 
as the same across all of these different images, such that it's no longer so great to be looking at this array of dots. And there were many possibilities. It could have been that they were encoding how dark the display was, how contrasty the display was, how many edges there were, and so forth. But what she was able to show through controlled tests is what they were encoding was the approximate number of elements in the array. And in her initial studies, these were six-month-old infants, and they were uh, encoding number differences up to a level of accuracy of about a two to one ratio. So if an infant was bored with arrays of eighteen of uh, eight dots, for example, they would subsequently look longer if she showed them a new array of four dots or sixteen dots, differences in a uh, two to one ratio. On the other hand, if she changed from an array of eight dots to an array of twelve dots, they continued to be bored, showing that their uh, numerical discrimination was extremely uh, imprecise. But she and others then went on to show that although numerical discrimination is imprecise, it's actually highly abstract. So at a point in time when a baby can just discriminate 8 from 16 dots in a uh, vis visual image, they're also able to just discriminate 8 from 16 jumps of a puppet, a three-dimensional puppet on a stage. Mm -hmm. And they're also just able to discriminate eight from 16 sounds in a sequence of sounds where they're presented over trials with sounds of many different kinds, uh, animal cries, uh, co uh, horns honking, and so forth. Uh, and in all of these cases, care was taken to control for other variables like how much uh, sound was being presented, how long uh, uh, a sound sequence uh, took to occur, how rapid the rate of change was within the sequence, and so forth. So in all of these cases, infants seem to arrive at an abstract representation of approximate number. So even as infants, we actually have a rep representation, not just of contrast or of quantity, but of a kind of abstract representation of approximate magnitude. So right. what do we learn? Numerical magnitude, discrete number. So what do we learn then from the fact that the inaccuracies in this approximate magnitude are in ratio terms, as opposed to that they right. say a certain absolute right. number. That I mean, off. the first thing that really surprised us was that infants have this ability, mm -hmm. but the second thing that surprised us was how systematic it is and how closely related the infant's sense of number is to the sense of number that we find in adults. So the first uh, uh, relationship comes from this ratio property. As I said, infants at about six months of age can discriminate numbers in a two-to-one ratio. If you go back in time uh, uh, to newborn infants, you require a larger ratio difference, a three-to-one ratio, to see reliable discrimination. So a newborn infant can discriminate eight from 12, uh, sorry, four from 12, but not four from eight. Um, on the other hand, as you get older, the ratio narrows but even for us as adults, if we put adults in the position of an infant, in effect, by flashing an array of dots too briefly for us to go around and count the items one by one, we, too, form an approximate representation of number, mm -hmm. and our representation shows a ratio signature. We discriminate numbers at a much finer ratio than a six-month-old infant does or even than a four-year-old child does, but nevertheless, our uh, discrimination depends on the ratio of the two numbers, suggesting a common system of numerical representation present uh, from birth to maturity, gradually getting tuned up in uh, precision, but not otherwise changing fundamentally. So suppose, for example, I walked into a room and there were 120 people in the room. Or mm -hmm. say, that for make it easier, there were 100 people in the room. Okay. How much, what kinds of numbers could I discriminate? Could I figure out, could I guess that there was a difference if I came back a second later and there were 120 people in the room? Or if there were 110 uh, people in the room? Or okay. Um, in, when this has been looked at in the lab, uh, and that tends to be in studies where the people turn into dots and the room turns into a computer screen, yeah, yeah. Uh, adults are able to, uh, in general, to discriminate between numbers in about a uh, 7 to 8 ratio. If we push you, give you a little training, you might get up to 8 to 9. Uh, if we test you under conditions where there's lots of other things going on, then your sensitivity may go down to 6 to 7. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's somewhere in that range. So now, as adults, we have this other ability, an ability not just to discriminate that there are you know, a different number of people now than there used to be, but even to name certain numbers that I could say there are precisely 100 dots in on this screen. So now, 
uh, can we see even our, in our use of that kind of ability, the ability to name things with actual numbers, the effects of this kind of process, this, uh, these effects of this kind of uh, more analog ratio-based system? I think some of the most interesting work that's been done in adults' numerical cognition over the last 20 years or so has been work that shows that even when we're reasoning about number in completely symbolic tasks, the kinds of ta uh, operations that we learn in school, like symbolic uh, addition or subtraction or multiplication, our abilities to engage in these reasoning processes depend in part on this sense of approximate number that we've had since infancy. And you see these effects in a number of different ways. One is you see them in simply looking at how long does it take us to perform different symbolic um, numerical operations. Suppose, for example, I ask you to tell me as quickly as you can uh, whether a given uh, arithmetic uh, a sentence of arithmetic is true or false. Mm -hmm. uh, so I say uh, 7 plus uh, 5 equals 13. Quick, uh, quick as you can, true or false. And I see how long it takes you to make that judgment relative to problem where I say 7 plus 5 equals 19. Mm -hmm. And both of these are arithmetically false. Both of them contradict with what you learned in school, that the answer is exactly 12. But it will take you longer to reject the 13 as an answer than it will to reject 19 as mm -hmm. an answer. Uh, and studies that have probed this ability show that part of the reason for that is because when we solve these purely symbolic arithmetic problems, we do so in part by activating these non-symbolic number representations. Mm -hmm. And probably the clearest evidence that that's what we're doing comes from research that takes these basic abilities uh, and probes them through the tools of cognitive neuroscience. We can see, for example, if we give symbolic arithmetic problems to adults while uh, uh, measuring their uh, spatial distribution of brain activation uh, with functional magnetic resonance imaging, you see activation during symbolic tasks of brain areas that also are active when we perform non-symbolic arithmetic. And perhaps more dramatically, if you now localize uh, the, the crucial central brain area, which is around the, the back of your head in uh, parietal cortex, um, you uh, localize that in an individual subject with magnetic resonance imaging, and then use transcranial magnetic stimulation to temporarily deactivate that area. Now you can give people both symbolic and non-symbolic arithmetic problems mm -hmm. to solve. Now, not surprisingly, they're much worse at the non-symbolic arithmetic problems. Uh, that's not surprising because we've targeted just the area that seems to be most activated in non-symbolic tasks. But the interesting and I think really surprising finding is people are also impaired at symbolic uh, arithmetic mm -hmm. operations uh, after uh, uh, in, in these experiments. And so I think what that's telling us is that this system of representation that we have that goes all the way back to infancy, that shows enormous continuity over development, continues to work for us when we engage in activities beyond the can of any infant or unschooled uh, child that are formal, symbolic, uh, learned uh, abilities at the foundations of mathematics and science are building in part on these non-symbolic abilities, uh, what I call core knowledge. So what... Speaking now of core knowledge, what is this fact about n about number in particular telling us about human cognition more generally? I mean, is this a kind of yeah. case study that we could generalize to think about? I think so. And I think it's actually telling us two things. Um, the first conclusion is what follows from all of the uh, findings that we've been talking about so far, uh, that there's enormous continuity in human cognition over development. Now, we've known for a long time that there's uh, continuity in biological processes over human uh, development, that there's continuity in basic sensory processes. We've known for quite a while that there's continuity in basic perceptual uh, processes, that uh, uh, near the beginning of life, infants are perceiving depth and sa speech sounds and other kinds of perceptible events uh, in qualitatively the same kinds of ways uh, as older children and adults. The first general conclusion that comes from this work is that the same continuity applies at the level of abstract thought. Abstract concepts like number, uh, concepts like mechanical causality, concepts uh, of geometry, other areas that have also been investigated uh, in similar ways to the number case that we're talking about. All of these are cases that show strong continuity over 
uh, human development, continuity going all the way back to the be, uh, beginning of life. That, I think, is the first conclusion. But the second conclusion that we haven't really focused on yet comes from going back and looking at properties of the core number system, uh, uh, some of which I've already mentioned, the crucial one, the ratio limit. This is an imprecise system. Uh, what's more, uh, there are other properties of this system that I haven't uh, mentioned yet, but that have emerged from other studies on infants that vary the types of displays that infants are presented with. So a second property of this system is that whereas infants very readily form number representations when you present them with large numbers of things, they're much less apt to form number representations if you present them with very small numbers of things. Kind of in the same way as if I were to present you with an apple, your immediate representation would probably be an apple, not a set with cardinal value one. The same seems to be true for infants, not only when you present them with one object, but when you present them with two objects or three objects. Uh, very roughly, what infants seem to represent, if you present an array of two objects, is a thing and another thing distinct from the first thing, not a set with cardinal value two. Uh, similarly, for an array of three objects. Uh, now, if that's right, then there are two quite prominent differences between the kind of numerical representations that infants form and the natural number representations that we t tend most readily to come to our minds when we think explicitly about number, that is to say, the representations that we get from counting. First of all, the infants seem to have two systems of representation, one focused on small numbers of objects, the other on these uh, large numerical magnitudes, but second, the infant's representations seem to be inherently limited. Uh, the small number representation maxes out at about three. Uh, if you look in situations that elicit representations of objects, you find that infants can keep track of one object or two, or under certain circumstances, three objects, but they fail to keep track of larger numbers of objects. And then, of course, the large uh, uh, number system uh, that we started our discussion with uh, is limited in a different way. It's limited in precision, uh, and even for adults, never uh, allows for precise numerical representations beyond about uh, seven uh, or eight. So there must be a dramatic conceptual change taking place over the course of childhood that gets us from these core knowledge systems to the system of counting and natural number that seems most intuitive to mm -hmm. us as adults. Okay, so now with this background in place, suppose we turn to this new kind of research that you've been doing with Katie Kinsler on okay. social categories. So we've got this basic idea of core knowledge and the idea of building on core knowledge to develop subsequent re representations. How do we use this kind of understanding or this paradigm to make sense of the way we think of human beings as opposed to numbers and the way that human beings fit into different kinds of social groups? Yeah. This is an area that we're just starting to study. Uh, if I sound a lot less confident in coming up with conclusions in this area than I am in the case of number, you can attribute that to the fact that uh, our studies of social categories are a few years old at most uh, in contrast to the study of number, which goes back uh, a good 20 years in some cases now. Uh, nevertheless, I think we're starting to get hints of answers to some very basic and general questions about human social categories. So I think there are, there are two phenomena that are uh, immediately striking to any observer of human social life. The first phenomenon is uh, that we see ourselves as members of social groups. And everywhere you go in the world, you find people identifying themselves and the people immediately around them uh, as members of a group that contrasts with other social groups. Uh, uh, and one's relationships with people in one's own group seem to be different everywhere from one's relationships with people in uh, other groups. Sometimes relationships with out-group people become antagonistic, sometimes not, but always there seem to be these social group distinctions. So that's phenomenon one. That seems to be true all over the world. Um, but phenomenon two, if we ask, 
what are the bases of the social group distinctions that people make, we see enormous uh, variability. Uh, so here, uh, over the last uh, uh, few months, with all the discussions about the election, there's been enormous focus on uh, the social group category of race as uh, a distinction, uh, clearly with an important history in the United States, uh, and that importantly impacts on people's sense of themselves and of uh, other people. But you go to other uh, parts of the world, or also uh, subgroups within the United States, you find uh, uh, social group distinctions based on religion, based on political affiliation, based on what seem to be quite arbitrary things, like what sports team uh, you're uh, a fan of. And as one looks around the world, one sees many, many different uh, bases for social distinctions. And that raises, I think, an interesting problem uh, for the study of social cognitive development, which is how can we account at one and the same time for the universality of social group distinctions and the incredible flexibility of the bases for those distinctions. And as in the case of cognitive development, when we see a complex phenomenon in adults, my thoughts tend to turn to infants in hopes that we'll find in infants the, the seeds and perhaps the most fundamental bases uh, of of these phenomena that become so prominent later in life. So, so far we have the basic idea that we're going to be looking at the early seeds of this kind of, de of social groups, uh, understanding among infants. So what yep. did you guys actually do to try to figure that out? Okay, well, uh, let me give some background to our work, first of all. Uh, before we started doing this work, uh, there were a number of studies that attempted to get at infants' social preferences by looking at looking preferences. So, for example, infants would be presented with... Uh, uh, two faces of people of different races, mm -hmm. or two faces of people of different gender, or two faces of people of different ages, and uh, investigators would ask, do they look longer at one of these two faces than the other? And what these studies showed was that infants show a uh, preference in each of uh, these cases for faces that are relatively more familiar to them. Mm -hmm. So, in particular, in the case of adult faces, uh, given a choice between a male face and a female face, infants will tend to look primarily at the face of the same gender as their primary uh, caregiver. Mm -hmm. uh, female in, uh, with an overall female preference in most studies, but that in mm -hmm. studies that have actually uh, singled out infants uh, who are primarily cared for by their fathers or mm -hmm. by a male uh, caregiver, that reverses to a male preference. We also see uh, people have also reported preference in infants for faces of their own race, mm -hmm. particularly when that race is the majority race in the uh, culture that, that infants are exposed to. So but what this, thing, study, cannot, sorry. Is, but this yeah? thing is very unlikely to then turn out to be aspect of core knowledge. I mean, no okay. one thinks that infants have core knowledge of r racial differences. Well, let's get to that, okay? All these studies show so far mm -hmm. is that infants prefer to look at faces that are relatively more familiar to them. But that raises two questions. The first question is, does this difference in familiarity carry any social weight for them? Does this have any social meaning for them? Um, and the second question is, are all of these different bases of familiarity equal or are some more powerful than others. Mm -hmm. And this was really the starting point that brought us uh, into this field. Us being uh, Katie Kinsler, a uh, former student uh, who's now on the faculty at the University of Chicago, and who's really responsible for uh, all of the work uh, that, that I'll be uh, discussing now. Mm -hmm. um, Katie looked at uh, uh, human societies uh, around the world, and also was strongly influenced by the thinking of uh, evolutionary psychologists, uh, particularly Robert Kurzban, uh, Lita Cosmides, and John Tooby, uh, arguing that race, as you just said, is a poor candidate for a core distinction uh, that humans would have evolved to encompass. The reason for that is that until um, the age of exploration, humans were never regularly in contact with people of other races. But uh, Cosmity and, and Tubi did note that people would be in contact with other neighboring groups, mm -hmm. and neighboring groups can differ in other ways. Now, many of the ways in which neighboring groups distinguish themselves uh, in pre-industrial uh, societies involve what look to be relatively arbitrary uh, and surely learned uh, properties like um, 
patterns of dress, uh, markings on uh, uh, the body, and, and so forth. But there's one way in which neighboring groups distinguish themselves that's universal, uh, and that is the accent with which mm-hmm. they speak. We know that people in a subgroup who are intensely interacting with each other will develop subtle manners of speaking that will... Uh, uh, resemble one another and distinguish them from members of other groups. And this observation led Katie to ask whether infants will show preferences for people who speak to them in their native language with their native accent over people who speak uh, a foreign language or who speak their, na- uh, their native language but with a foreign accent. Mm-hmm. So Katie's studies were very simple. Her initial studies used the same preferential looking methods as the studies of race preferences and gender preferences. So she presented infants, five-month-old infants, so well before the age where they're speaking themselves, she presented them with uh, uh, movie clips of two people, uh, bilingual people, uh, who each spoke to the infant in turn, and for half the infants, person A spoke, these were uh, Boston infants, person A spoke in English, person B spoke in Spanish. For the other half, uh, the languages were reversed. Mm -hmm. And then, after watching these two people speaking in alternation, the infants were presented with the two people now silent, side by side. And the infants looked longer at the person who had previously spoken to them in their native language. Mm -hmm. So this is telling us, one, that babies were attentive to the language, that they remembered over the short intervals in this study who spoke how, uh, and even though they weren't speaking themselves, this uh, memory ultimately uh, influenced how much time they spent looking at each of the two people. Mm -hmm. But of course, neither this study nor any of the previous ones tells us that that this distinction actually has social meaning for them. So to try to get at that, Katie did further studies that probed uh, in different ways are infants uh, predisposed to respond differently uh, socially to people who have spoken their native language or spoken with their native accent. So in one series of studies that she did, uh, these studies now were done uh, in two different language groups. Uh, they involved infants in Boston, but also infants in Paris. And in both places, infants saw uh, videotapes of two people, a native speaker of English and a native speaker of French. They spoke to the infant in turn, and then each of the two people uh, popped up a toy uh, offered the toy, on film this is now, offered the toy to, uh, showed the toy to the infant, and then went through a gesture as if they were offering a toy to, uh, to the infant. Uh, and at this point, a magical event occurred. As the toys left the screen, real toys popped up in front of the infant, who now had the choice of choosing between them. And what Katie found was that these infants, who were 10 months of age, uh, chose the toy offered by the person who had previously spoken their native language, even though the two people were silent at the time that the offering occurred. Mm -hmm. The babies in Paris took the toy uh, predominantly that was offered by the person who had previously spoken French, and the babies in Boston took the toy uh, offered by the person who previously spoke English. So this suggests that already at 10 months, infants are predisposed to interact with a person who uh, speaks to them in uh, their native language. Now, she then went on to ask, what about socially guided learning? Uh, will it be the case that uh, infants will be predisposed to learn about the world from people who signal by their language or their accent that they're members of their own social group? Mm -hmm. So to get at that, uh, she uh, and uh, another collaborator, Kristen Schutz, uh, uh, soon moving to the um, University of Wisconsin, Uh, They did further studies uh, looking at a culturally very important kind of learning, learning food preferences, learning what kinds of things are edible. Uh, In this study, again, uh, they uh, presented babies with two people who spoke alternately uh, in their native language versus in a foreign language. Each of the two people then uh, picked up a uh, jar of baby food, differently colored uh, baby food, uh, and sampled it and offered it to the infant. And after both had done, uh, each of them had done their offering, uh, the two samples of baby, the two real samples of baby food were presented to the infants. And once again, infants selectively chose the food that had been offered by the uh, person who had previously spoken to them in their native language. So what all of these studies, I think, are suggesting is that language is serving as a cue uh, not only to who's familiar and who's not familiar, uh, but in some important ways to who might be considered as 
someone from my own group? Who uh, would be an appropriate person to teach me what sorts of things I should eat? Who would be an appropriate person for me to interact with, to accept a toy from, and so forth? And have there been any studies exa- that compare this cue to other cues? I mean, is there any way yes. to know whether... Yeah. Yes. Um, the studies uh, that do this in, there there are some uh, new studies doing this in uh, infancy. Uh, they're still in progress, uh, so I think I should be cautious and not talk about their findings mm-hmm. yet. But I can talk about findings uh, from somewhat older children. Mm-hmm. So studies have been done with children ranging in age from about three years to about five years, uh, assessing children's social preferences and children's socially guided learning. So in a test of social preferences, you might take a three-year-old child and show them uh, a uh, photograph, photographs of two children, uh, then show the, ch- that, uh, the child that the two children either speak with different accents. Uh, you can show this by playing little audio clips going with each of the two photographs of a child's voice uh, speaking with different accents. Uh, or you can show them, uh, the child can see that the two photographs uh, Uh, present to children of different races, uh, children of different genders, and so forth. And in the social preference study, after introducing each of the two children, you can ask questions like, who looks nicer? Uh, Who would you like to be friends with? Uh, Which of these kids would you like to meet more? Etc. And when you do these studies, what you find is that although language and accent are guides to social preferences throughout childhood, Uh, race seems to emerge as a guide to social preferences somewhere between age three and age five. So three-year-old children uh, in our samples are showing no social preferences uh, by race. Uh, On the other hand, five-year-old children are starting to show uh, social preferences by race. And I should say, because there's an asymmetry in American uh, populations. Uh, the general finding is that majority race kids, uh, white kids, will show preferences for other white kids uh, over black kids, and that's what that's what we find uh, emerging between three and five years of age. But then, in uh, her most their most recent studies, uh, Katie Kinsler and Kristen Schutz asked, "What happens if we present both information about a person's accent?" and information about a person's race. So uh, what they did was, again, using this method with five-year-old children presenting two pictures of different people, mm-hmm. one, uh, two children, one uh, black, one white. Uh, in the absence of any sound, the, the children who were white pick the uh, white child as, uh, tend to pick the white child as uh, the one they would rather have as a friend. But now you say, let's listen to each of these kids. And they both speak in English, but one of them speaks with a Boston accent and the other one speaks with a French accent. Mm -hmm. And what you find then is that if the African-American child speaks with the native accent and the uh, white child speaks with the foreign accent, the preferences reverse and the children go with the native-accented child over the child uh, of their own race. You know, I bet you would find exactly the same thing if you were looking at the prejudice people show against others, say, in the I academic job would. market. We, like, we want to do that study. So uh, see if you we had really want to do that. Uh, M&M speaking with a ghetto right, right. accent versus uh, Barack Obama or, you know, but with unknown people, varying accent versus race, mm-hmm. uh, I bet that uh, that accent will be more powerful. Uh, or similarly, clothing versus race. If you saw someone who was dressed all ghetto but spoke like an American academic versus right. someone... <laughs> <laughs> who, who, yeah, you can see that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. My bet is that accent will win. And I think there are good reasons why it should, why this would be a particularly uh, informative cue to social group uh, membership. Because uh, accent has two properties to it. Actually, language in general have two, has two properties to it. The first is that it's learned. So the accent with which you speak is a good indicator of the environment uh, within which you grew and the group uh, uh, within which you grew. It's a very good indicator of that. But the second property of accent is it's extremely hard to fake. Mm 
Uh, it's not so hard to put on face paint that makes you look mm-hmm. like a member of another group. Uh, it's much harder. Of course, not impossible. Some people are great at this. Some actors are great at this. Uh, uh, but it's much harder in general to fake an accent uh, than it is to fake other signs of group membership. So I think uh, there, are good, there are, are good reasons that one can see why uh, it could have been advantageous if uh, humans are predisposed to divide the world into different groups, and if it matters to our interactions and our learning, even early in development, to be able to determine when another person is a member of our group or not. Um, I think there's good reasons why accent would be a particularly reliable cue to use. So we now are getting some scientific evidence that the uh, feelings we have toward others who say are, are of a different coalition or speak with a different accent might be a result not just of something learned, but of core knowledge. Yeah. So now what implications does that have for the chances, say, of changing the way that we feel about these people who are of other groups? Well, that's the question that got me into this work. Uh, because as in the case of other systems of core knowledge, I think there are two sides uh, to core social knowledge. On the one hand, humans are an immensely social species, uh, and many of our cognitive achievements depend crucially on our abilities to learn from one another, to communicate with one another, to collaborate with one another, and so forth. So early developing mechanisms that allow children to make intelligent decisions about who would be the, the, the people most likely to take care of me, who would be the best people for me to collaborate with, who would be the best people for me to learn from, if my goal is to grow up to be uh, an adaptively functioning member of a particular social world. Uh, One can see in all of these ways that an initial predisposition to focus on language and accent and use it, perhaps among other things, as a basis for dividing up the social world could be highly adaptive. But I think we can also see uh, by glancing at any newspaper, by looking at any account of world events, how this same tendency preserved in adults stand uh, Uh, holding for us a central status in our ways of evaluating the social world uh, can get us into trouble. And there is where I hope that the study of core knowledge in other domains, like number, can start to point the way uh, toward uh, changes that we can make that will allow us to continue to build in uh, good and adaptive ways on the core abilities uh, uh, that we're endowed with while overcoming some of their limitations. And number is one of my favorite examples because we can see so clearly in the domain of number that as adults in our mathematical reasoning, we both rely on systems of core knowledge and we transcend them. We transcend them even as five-year-old children when we learn counting and natural number. And as one goes on in mathematics and as one harnesses mathematics in uh, uh, other endeavors, science and technology and exploration and so forth, uh, we're continually elaborating on and transforming the systems of core knowledge uh, that served as the basis for this development. And so my hope is that If it is the case, and as I said, our research is still at a very early stage here, but if it is the case that we are biologically predisposed to divide the world into social groups, uh, to pick out members of our own groups, uh, and to uh, learn from those members, uh, my hope is that we also have another ability that we see in uh, the domain of number and uh, and other areas, which is an ability to change our conceptions and extend them beyond uh, their initial bounds. Uh, And my hope is that we'll see this happening in this case, that that, uh, we'll be able to look back on our core conceptions and say, yes, they're useful, but they also have these limits that get us into trouble, particularly in the highly interconnected world that we live in as adults. So what we need is a kind of coalitional mathematics, the equivalent (laughs) in the domain of thinking about groups of what we see in, say, a five-year-old as opposed to an infant in mathematics. Okay, with that hope, let us um, come to an end of our dialogue. Okay. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Spalkim. It's been a pleasure.